Welcome to today's Triple Z. The Triple Z Podcast is a daily program that you can use to help you fall asleep each night. Just turn down the volume, lay back, relax, and enjoy as you fall asleep. Stalemate in Space is a science fiction novel written by Charles L. Harness, originally published in 1957. The story takes place in a future world where a conflict between two powerful galactic empires, the Parahuans and the Terrans, has reached a stalemate. This deadlock in space is due to the balance of power maintained by both empires' advanced technology. The plot revolves around the efforts of both sides to break the stalemate and achieve victory. The Terrans, led by the protagonist, The brilliant and resourceful scientist Al Barker work on developing a new, more powerful weapon that can tip the balance in their favor. However, the Parahuans have their own secret weapon, a telepathic spy who has infiltrated the Terran ranks. If you enjoy our program, please be sure to write us a review on your podcast platform and share us with a friend. You both might sleep just a little better at night. Our website is triple Z, that's three Z's dot media. You can also like and share our content on Facebook or our Instagram account ZZZ Media Podcast. Music for today's episode was provided by the Sleep Channel on Spotify. One. At first there was only the voice, a monotonous murmur in her ears. Die now, die now, die now. Evelyn Kane awoke, breathing slowly and painfully. The top of the cubicle was bulging inward on her chest, and it seemed likely that a rib or two was broken. How long ago? Years? Minutes? She had no way of knowing. Her slender right hand found the oxygen valve and turned it. For a long while she lay, hurting and breathing helplessly. Die now, die now, die now. The Votron had awakened her with its heartbreaking code message and it was her duty to carry out its command. Nine years after the great bow globes had crunched together, the mentors had sealed her in this tiny cell, dormant, unwaking, to be livened only when it was certain her countrymen had either definitely won or lost. The Votron's telepathic dirge chronicled the latter fact. She had expected nothing else. She had only to find the relay beside her cot, press the key that would set in motion gigantic prime movers in the heart of the great globe, and the conquerors would join the conquered in the wide and nameless grave of space. But life, now doled out by the second, was too delicious to abandon immediately. Her mind, like that of a drowning person, raised hungrily over the memories of her past. For 20 years, in company with her great father, she had watched the Defender grow from a vast metal skeleton into a planet-sized bow globe. But it had not grown fast enough, for when the Scythian globe, the invader, sprang out of black space to enslave the budding Terran Confederacy, the Defender was unfinished, half-equipped, and undermanned. The Terrans could only fight for time and hope for a miracle. The Defender, commanded by her father, Gordon, Lord Kane, hurled itself from its orbit around Procyon and met the invader with giant fish and torpedoes. And then, in an intergalactic proton storm beyond the Lesser Magellanic Cloud, the globes lost their bearings and collided. Hordes of brute men poured through the crushed outer armor of the stricken defender. The prone woman stirred uneasily. Here the images became unreal and terrible with the recurrent vision of death. It had taken the Scythians nine years to conquer the defender's outer shell. Then had come that final interview with her father. In half an hour our last spaceport will be captured he had telepathed curtly. Only one more messenger ship can leave the Defender. Be on it. No. I shall die here. 
His fine tired eyes had studied her face in enigmatic appraisal. Then die usefully. The mentors are trying to develop a force that will destroy both globes in the moment of our inevitable defeat. If they are successful, you will have the task of pressing the final button of the battle. There's an off chance you may survive, countered a mentor. We're also working on means for your escape not only because you are Gordon's daughter, but because this great proton storm will prevent radio contact with Terra for years, and we want someone to escape with our secret if and when our experiments prove successful. But you must expect to die, her father had warned with gentle finality. She clenched her fingernails vehemently into her palms and wrenched herself back to the present. That time had come. With some effort, she worked herself out of the crumpled bed and lay on the floor of her little cubicle, panting and holding her chest with both hands. The metal floor was very cold. Evidently, the enemy torpedo fissionables had finally broken through to the center portions of the ship, letting in the icy breath of space. Small matter. Not by freezing would she die. She reached out her hand, felt for the all-important key, and gasped in dismay. The mahogany box containing the key had burst its metal bonds and was lying on its side. The explosion that had crushed her cubicle had been terrific. With a gurgle of horror, she snapped on her wrist luminar and examined the interior of the box. It was a shattered ruin. Once the fact was clear, she composed herself and lay there, breathing hard and thinking. She had no means to construct another key. At best, finding the rare tools and parts would take months, and during the interval the invaders would be cutting loose from the dead hulk that clutched their conquering battle globe in a metallic rigor mortis. She gave herself six weeks to accomplish this stalemate in space. Within that time, she must know whether the prime movers were still intact and whether she could safely enter the pile room herself, set the movers in motion and draw the moderator columns. If it were unsafe, she must secure the unwitting assistance of her Scythian enemies. Still prone, she found the first aid kit and taped her chest expertly. The cold was beginning to make itself felt so she flicked on the chod year she wore as an undergarment to her Scythian woman's uniform. Then she crawled on her elbows and stomach to the tiny door, spun the ceiling gear, and was soon outside. Ignoring the pain and pulling on the side of the imitation rock that contained her cell, she got slowly to her feet. The air was thin indeed, and frigid. She turned the valve of her portable oxygen bottle almost subconsciously while exploring the surrounding blackened forest as far as she could see. Mentally, she was alert for roving alien minds. She had left her weapons inside the cubicle, except for the three things in the little leather bag dangling from her waist, for she knew that her greatest weapon in the struggle to come would be her apparent harmlessness. Four hundred yards behind her, she detected the mind of a low-born scythe of the Tharn Sun group. Very quickly, she established it as that of a tired, brutish corporal taking a mop-up squad through the black stumps and forlorn branches of the small forest that for years had supplied oxygen to the defenders of this sector. The corporal could not see her green Scythian uniform clearly and evidently took her for a Terran woman. In his mind was the question, should he shoot immediately or should he capture her? It had been two months since he had seen a woman. But then, his orders were to shoot. Yes, he would shoot. Evelyn turned in profile to the beam gun and stretched luxuriously, hoping that her grimace of pain could not be detected. With satisfaction, she sensed a sudden change of determination in the mind of the Tharn. The gun was lowered, and the man was circling to creep up behind her. He did not bother to notify his men. 
He wanted her first. He had seen her uniform, but that deterred him not a whit. Afterwards, he would call up the squad. Finally, they would kill her and move on. Women auxiliaries had no business here, anyway. Hips dipping, Evelyn sauntered into the shattered cops. The man moved faster, though still trying to approach quietly. Most of the rat ions in the mile high ceiling had been destroyed and the light was poor. He was not surprised when he lost track of his quarry. He tiptoed rapidly onward, picking his way through the charred and fallen branches, thinking that she must turn up again soon. He had not gone 20 yards in this manner when a howl of unbearable fury sounded in his mind and the dull light in his brain went out. Breathing deeply from her mental effort, the woman stepped from behind a great black tree trunk and hurried to the unconscious man. For IQs of 100 and less, telepathic cortical paralysis was quite effective. With cool efficiency and no trace of distaste, she stripped the odorous uniform from the man, then took his weapon, turned the beam power down very low, and needled a neat slash across his throat. While he bled to death, she slipped deftly into the baggy suit, clasped the beam gun by the handle, and started up the city slope. For a time, at least, it would be safer to pass as a thorn soldier than as any kind of a woman. 2. The Inquisitor leaned forward, frowning at the girl before him. Name? Evelyn Kane. The eyes of the Inquisitor widened. So you admit to a Terran name. Well, Terran, you were charged with having stolen passage on a supply lorry, and you also seem to be wearing the uniform of an infantry corporal as well as that of a Scythian woman auxiliary. Incidentally, where is the corporal? Did you kill him? He was prepared for a last ditch denial. He would cut it short, have the guards remove her, and execution would follow immediately. In a way, it was unfortunate. The woman was obviously of a high tearing class. No, he couldn't consider that. His slender means couldn't afford another woman in his quarters, and besides, he wouldn't feel safe with this cool murderess. Do you not understand the master, Tom? Why did you kill the corporal? He leaned impatiently over his desk. The woman stared frankly back at him with her clear blue eyes. The guards on either side of her dug their nails into her arms, as was their custom with recalcitrant prisoners, but she took no notice. She had analyzed the minds of the three men. She could handle the Inquisitor alone or the two guards alone, but not all three. If you aren't afraid of me, perhaps you'd be so kind as to send the guards out for a few minutes, she said, placing a hand on her hip. I have interesting information. So that was it. By her freedom by betraying fugitive Terrence. Well, he could take the information and then kill her. He nodded curtly to the guards and they walked out of the hut exchanging slime winks with one another. Evelyn Kane crossed her arms across her chest and felt her broken rib gingerly. The Inquisitor stared up at her in sadistic admiration. He would certainly be on hand for the execution. His anticipation was cut short with a horrible realization. Under the paralyzing force of a mind greater than his own, he reached beneath the desk and switched off the recorder. Who is the occupational commandant for this sector? She asked tersely. This must be done swiftly before the guards returned. Parrot, discount of Tharn, replied the man mechanically. What is the extent of his jurisdiction? From the center of the Terran globe, outward 400 miles radius. Good. Prepare for me the usual visa that a woman clerk needs for passage to the offices of the occupational commandant. 
The Inquisitor filled in blanks in a stiff sheet of paper and stamped a seal at its bottom. You will add in the portion reserved for comments the following capable clerk. Others will follow as they are found available. The man's pen scratched away obediently. Evelyn Kane smiled gently at the impotent, inwardly raging inquisitor. She took the paper, folded it, and placed it in a pocket in her blouse. Call the guards, she ordered. He pressed the button on his desk and the guards re-entered. This person is no longer a prisoner, said the Inquisitor woodenly. She is to take the next transport to the Occupational Commandant of Zone 1. When the transport had left, neither Inquisitor nor guards had any memory of the woman. However, in the due course of events, the recording was gathered up with many others like it, boxed carefully, and sent to the office of the Occupational Commandant, Zone 1, for auditing. Evelyn was extremely careful with her mental probe as she descended from the transport. The occupational commandant would undoubtedly be highborn and telepathic. He must not have occasion to suspect a similar ability in a mere clerk. Fighting had passed this way, too, and recently. Many of the buildings were still smoking and many of the rat ions high above were either shot out or obscured by slowly drifting dust clouds. The acrid odor of radiation remover was everywhere. She caught the sound of spasmodic small on fire. What is that? She asked the transport attendant. The commandant is shooting prisoners, he replied laconically. Oh, where did you want to go? to the personnel office. That way, he pointed to the largest building of the group two stories high, reasonably intact. She walked off down the gravel path, which was stained here and there with dark sticky red. She gave her visa to the guard at the door and was admitted to an improvised waiting room where another guard eyed her stonily. The firing was much nearer. She recognized the obscene coughs of a fake pistol and began to feel sick. A woman in the green uniform of the Scythe Auxiliary came in, whispered something to the guard, and then told Evelyn to follow her. In the anteroom, a gray cat looked her over curiously, and Evelyn frowned. She might have to get rid of the cat if she stayed here. Under certain circumstances, the animal could prove her deadliest enemy. The next room held a foppish little man, evidently a supervisor of some sort, who was studying her visa. I'm very happy to have you here, Shriya Dash. He looked at the visa suspiciously, Dash Shriya Lin. Do sit down. But as I was just remarking to Shriya Garek, here he nodded to the other woman who smiled back dash I wish the field officers would make up their august minds as to whether they want you or don't want you. Just why did they transfer you to HQ? She thought quickly. This pompous little ass would have to be given some answer that would keep him from checking with the Inquisitor. It would have to be something personal. She looked at the false black in his eyebrows and sideburns and the artificial way in which he had combed hair over his bald spot. She crossed her knees slowly, ignoring the narrowing eyes of Sriya Garek and smoothed the back of her braided yellow hair. He was studying her covertly. The men in the fighting zones are uncouth, Sriya Gorf, she said simply. I was told that you, that is, I mean Dash. Yes, he was the soul of graciousness. Shriya Garek began to dictate loudly into her mechanical transcriber. Evelyn cleared her throat, averted her eyes, and with some effort, managed a delicate flush. I meant to say, I thought I would be happier working for working here. So I asked for a transfer. Shriya Gorf beamed. Splendid. 
but the occupation isn't over yet, you know. There'll be hard work here for several weeks yet before we cut loose from the enemy globe. But you do your work while winking heartfully dash and I'll see that dash. He stopped and his face took on a hunted look of mingled fear and anxiety. He appeared to listen. Evelyn tensed her mind to receive and deceive a mental probe. She was certain now that the zone commandant was highborn and telepathic. The chances were only 50-50 that she could delude him for any length of time if he became interested in her. He must be avoided if at all possible. It should not be too difficult. He undoubtedly had a dozen personal secretaries and her concubines and would take small interest in the lowly employees that amused Gorf. Gorf looked at her uncertainly. Parrot, this Count of the Tharn's sons, sends you his compliments and wishes to see you on the balcony. He pointed to a hallway. All the way through there, across to the other wing. As she left, she heard all sound in the room stop. The transcribing and calculating machines trailed off into a watchful silence and she could feel the eyes of the men and women on her back. She noticed then that the fate had ceased firing. Her heart was beating faster as she walked down the hall. She felt a very strong probe flooding over her brain casually, palping with mild interest the artificial memories she supplied escapades with officers in the combat areas. Reprimands. Demotion and transfer. Her deception of Gorf. Her anticipation of meeting a real Viscount and hoping he would let her dance for him. The questing probe withdrew as idly as it had come and she breathed a sigh of relief. She could not hope to deceive a suspicious telepath for long. Parrot was merely amused at her lie to his under-supervisor. He had accepted her at her own face value as supplied by her false memories. She opened the door to the balcony and saw a man leaning moodily on the balustrade. He gave no immediate notice of her presence. The 506th heir of Tharn was of uncertain age, as were most of the men of both globes. Only the left side of his face could be seen. It was gaunt and leathery, and a deep thin scar lifted the corner of his mouth into a satanic smile. A faint paunch was gathering in his abdomen as befitted a warrior turned to boring paperwork. His closely cut black hair and the two sparkling red gemmed rings apparently identical on his right hand seemed to denote a certain fastidiousness and unconscious superiority. To Evelyn the jewel fingers bespoke an unnatural contrast to the past history of the man and were symptomatic of a personality that could find stimulation only in strange and cruel pleasures. In alarm she suddenly realized that she had inadvertently let her appraisal penetrate her uncovered conscious mind and that this probe was there awaiting it. You are right, he said coldly, still staring into the court below. Now that the long battle is over, there is little left to divert me. He pushed the fag across the coping toward her. Take this. He had not as yet looked at her. She crossed the balcony, simultaneously grasping the pistol he offered her and looking down into the courtyard. There seemed to be nearly twenty Terrans lying about, in pools of their own blood. Only one man, a Terran officer of very high rank was left standing. His arms were folded somberly across his chest and he studied the killer above him almost casually. But when the woman came out, their eyes met and he started imperceptibly. Evelyn Kane felt a horrid chill creeping over her. The man's hair was white, now, and his proud face lined with deep furrows but there could be no mistake. It was Gordon, Lord Kane, her father. The sweat continued to grow on her forehead and she felt for a moment that she needed only to wish hard enough and this would be a dream. 
A dream of a big, kind, dark-haired man with laugh wrinkles about his eyes, who sat her on his knee when she was a little girl and read bedtime stories to her from a great book with many pictures. An icy, amused voice came through, our orders are to kill all prisoners. It is entertaining to shoot down helpless men, isn't it? It warms me to know that I am cruel and wanton and worthy of my trust. Even in the midst of her horror, a cold, analytical part of her was explaining why the Commandant had called her to the balcony. Because all captured Terrans had to be killed, he hated his superiors, his own men, and especially the prisoners. A task so revolting he could not relegate to his own officers. He must do it himself, but he wanted his underlings to know he loathed them for it. She was merely a symbol of that contempt. His next words did not surprise her. It is even more stimulating to require a shuddering female to kill them. You are shuddering, you know? She nodded dumbly. Her palm was so wet that a drop of sweat dropped from it to the floor. She was thinking hard. She could kill the Commandant and save her father for a little while. But then the problem of detonating the pile remained and it would not be solved more quickly by killing the man who controlled the pile area. On the contrary, if she could get him interested in her. So far as our records indicate, murmured Parrot, the man down there is the last living Terran within the Defender. It occurred to me that our newest clerk would like to start off her duties with a bang. The fag is adjusted to a needle beam. If you put a bolt between the man's eyes, you may dance for me tonight and perhaps there will be other nights dash. The woman seemed lost in thought for a long time. Slowly, she lifted the ugly little weapon. The doomed Terran looked up at her peacefully without expression. She lowered the fake, her arm trembling. Gordon, Lord Kane, frowned faintly, then closed his eyes. She raised the gun again, drew crosshairs with a nerveless wrist, and squeezed the trigger. There was a loud, hollow cough, but no recoil. The Terran officer, his eyes still closed and arms folded, sank to the ground face up. Blood was running from a tiny hole in his forehead. The man leaning on the balustrade turned and looked at Evelyn, at first with amused contempt, then with narrowing, questioning eyes. Come here, he ordered. The fate dropped from her hand. With a titanic effort, she activated her legs and walked toward him. He was studying her face very carefully. She felt that she was going to be sick. Her knees were so weak that she had to lean on the coping. With a forefinger, he lifted up the mass of golden curls that hung over her right forehead and examined the scar hidden there where the mentors had cut into her frontal lobe. The tiny doll they had created for her writhed uneasily in her waist purse, but Parrot seemed to be thinking of something else and missed the significance of the scar completely. He dropped his hand. I'm sorry, he said with a quiet weariness. I shouldn't have asked you to kill the Terran. It was a sorry joke. Then, have you ever seen me before? No, she whispered hoarsely. His mind was in hers, verifying the fact. Have you ever met my father, Fane, the old Count of Tharn? No. Do you have a son? No. His mind was out of hers again, and he had turned moodily back, surveying the courtyard and the dead. Gorf will be wondering what happened to you. Come to my quarters at the 8th Metron tonight. Apparently he suspected nothing. Father. Father. I had to do it. But we'll all join you, soon. Soon. Three.
Parrot lay on his couch, sipping cold purple tariff and following the thinly clad dancer with narrowed eyes. Music, soft and subtle, floated from his communications box, illegally tuned to an officer's club somewhere. Evelyn made the rhythm part of her as she swayed slowly on tiptoe. For the last three nights the hours allotted to rest and sleep it had been thus. By day she probed furtively into the minds of the office staff, memorizing area designations, channels for official messages, and the names and authorizations of occupational field crews. By night she danced for Parrot, who never took his eyes from her, nor his probe from her mind. While she danced it was not too difficult to elude the probe. There was an odd auto-hypnosis in dancing that blotted out memory and knowledge. Enough for now, he ordered. Careful of your rib. When he had first seen the bandages on her bare chest, that first night, she had been ready with a memory of dancing on a freshly waxed floor and of falling. Parrot seemed to be debating with himself as she sat down on her own couch to rest. He got up unlocked his desk and drew out a tiny reel of metal wire which Evelyn recognized as being feed for an amateur stereo projector. He placed the reel on a projector that had been installed in the wall, flicked off the table luminar, and both of them waited in the dark, breathing rather loudly. Suddenly the center of the room was bright with a ball of light some two feet in diameter and inside the luminous sphere were an old man a woman, and a little boy of about four years. They were walking through a luxurious garden, and then they stopped, looked up, and waved gaily. Evelyn studied the trio with growing wonder. The old man and the boy were complete strangers. But the woman dash. That is Fane, my father, said Parrot quietly. He stayed at home because he hated war. And that is a path in our country estate on Tharnar 7. The little boy I failed to recognize beyond a general resemblance to the Tharn line. But can you deny that you are the woman? The stereo snapped off and she sat wordless in the dark. There seemed to be some similarity dash, she admitted. Her throat was suddenly dry. Yet, why should she be alarmed? She really didn't know the woman. The table luminar was on now, and Parrot was prowling hungrily about the room, his scar twisting his otherwise handsome face into a snarling scowl. Similarity. Bah. That loop of hair over her right forehead hid a scar identical to yours. I have had the individual frames analyzed. Evelyn's hands nodded unconsciously. She forced her body to relax, but her mind was racing. This introduced another variable to be controlled in her plan for destruction. She must make it a known quantity. Did your father send it to you? She asked. The day before you arrived here. It had been en route for months, of course. What did he say about it? He said, your widow and son send greetings. Be of good cheer and accept our love. What nonsense. He knows very well I'm not married and that well, if I have ever fathered any children, I don't know about them. Is that all he said? That's all, except that he included this ring. He pulled one of the duplicate jewels from his right middle finger and tossed it to her. It's identical to the one he had made for me when I entered on my majority. For a long time it was thought that it was the only stone of its kind on all the planets of the Tharn Suns, a mineralogical freak, but I guess he found another. But why should I want two of them? Evelyn crossed the room and returned the ring. Existence is so full of mysteries, isn't it? murmured Parrot. Sometimes it seems unfortunate that we must pass through a sentient phase on our way to death. This foolish, foolish war. 
Maybe the old count was right. You could be court martial for that. Speaking of court martials, I've got to attend one tonight an appeal from a death sentence. He arose, smoothed his hair and clothes, and poured another glass of tariff. Some fool inquisitor can't show proper disposition of a woman prisoner. Evelyn's heart skipped a beat. Indeed, the wretch insists that he could remember if we would just let him alone. I suppose he took a bribe. You'll find one now and then who tries for a little extra profit. She must absolutely not be seen by the condemned inquisitor. The stimulus would almost certainly make him remember. I'll wait for you, she said indifferently, thrusting her arms out in a languorous yawn. Very well. Parrot stepped to the door, then turned and looked back at her. On the other hand, I may need a clerk. It's way after hours, and the others have gone. Beneath a gesture of wry protest, she swallowed rapidly. Perhaps you'd better come, insisted Parrot. She stood up, unloosed her waist purse, checked its contents swiftly, and then followed him out. This might be a very close thing. From the purse, she took a bottle of perfume and rubbed her ear lobes casually. Odd smell, commented Parrot, wrinkling his nose. Odd scent, corrected Evelyn cryptically. She was thinking about the earnest faces of the mentors as they instructed her carefully in the use of the perfume. The adrenaline glands, they had explained, provided a useful and powerful stimulant to a man in danger. Adrenaline slowed the heart and digestion, increased the systole and blood pressure, and increased perspiration to cool the skin. But there could be too much of a good thing. An overdose of adrenaline, they had pointed out, caused almost immediate edema. The lungs filled rapidly with the serum and the victim drowned. The perfume she possessed overstimulated, in some unknown way, the adrenals of frightened persons. It had no effect on inactive adrenals. The question remained who would be the more frightened, she or the condemned inquisitor? She was perspiring freely, and the blonde hair on her arms and neck was standing stiffly when Parrot opened the door for her and they entered the zone provost's chambers. One glance at the trembling creature in the prisoner's chair reassured her. The ex-inquisitor, shorn of his insignia, shabby and stubble-bearded, sat huddled in his chair and from time to time swept his grave tormentors with glazed eyes. He looked a long while at Evelyn. She got her bottle of perfume idly and held it open in her warm hand. The officers and judge provost were listening to the opening address of the prosecution and took no notice of her. More and more frequently the condemned man turned his gaze to Evelyn. She poured a little of the scent on her handkerchief. The prisoner coughed and rubbed his chin, trying to think. The charges were finally read, and the defense attorney began his opening statement. The prisoner, now coughing more frequently, was oblivious to all but the woman. Once she thought she saw a flicker of recognition in his eyes, and she fanned herself hurriedly with her handkerchief. The trial drawn onto a close. It was a mere formality. The prosecutor summed up by proving that a tearing woman had been captured, possibly named Evelyn Kane, turned over to the defendant for registration and disposal, and that the defendant's weekly accounts failed to show a receipt for the release of the woman. QED, the death sentence must be affirmed. The light in the prisoner's eyes was growing clearer, despite his bronchial difficulties. He began now to pay attention to what was said and to take notice of the other faces. It was as though he had finally found the weapon he wanted and patiently awaited an opportunity to use it. The defense was closing. 
Counsel for the prisoner declared that the latter might have been the innocent victim of the escapee, Evelyn Kane, possibly a telepathic tearing woman, because only a fool would have permitted a prisoner to escape without attempting to juggle the prison records unless his mind had been under telepathic control. They ought to be looking for Evelyn Kane now, instead of wasting time with her victim. She might be anywhere. She might even be in this building. He bowed apologetically to Evelyn. She smiled at the faces suddenly looking at her with new interest. The man in the prisoner's chair was peering at Evelyn through half-closed eyes, his arms crossed on his chest. He had stopped coughing and the fingers of his right hand were tapping patiently on his sleeve. If Parrot should at this moment probe the prisoner's mind. Evelyn, in turning to smile at Parrot, knocked the bottle from the table to the floor where it broke in a liquid tinkle. She put her hands to her mouth in contrite apology. The judge provost frowned and Parrot eyed her curiously. The prisoner was seized with such a spasm of coughing that the provost, who had stood to pronounce sentence, paused in annoyance. The racking ceased. The provost picked up the fig lying before him. Have you anything to say before you die? He asked coldly. The ex-inquisitor stood and turned a triumphant face to him. Excellency, you ask, where is the woman prisoner who escaped from me? Well, I can tell you. He clutched wildly at his throat, coughed horridly, and bent in Evelyn Kane's direction. She. His lips, which were rapidly growing purple, moved without saying anything intelligible, and he suddenly crashed over the chair into the floor. The prison physician leaped to him, stethoscope out. After a few minutes, he stood up, puzzled and frowning in the midst of a strained silence. Odd, very odd, he muttered. Did the prisoner faint? Asked the judge provost and curiously, lowering the fake. The prisoner's lungs are filled with liquid, apparently the result of hyperactive adrenals, commented the baffled physician. He's dead, and don't ask me to explain why. Evelyn smothered a series of hacking coughs in her handkerchief as the court broke up in excited groups. From the corner of her eye she saw that Parrot was studying her thoughtfully. 